Welcome to Salcedo Paranormal. It is, oops, I just clicked on the wrong thing. Okay, it is <laughs> Tuesday, uh, October 4th, 2022. And tonight I will be sharing true paranormal stories from the web. As always, you can find all the episodes of the show <laughs> along with links to social media, uh, ways to donate, and ways to contact me. Along with, um, well, that was actually it, okay, um, at the podcast page, and that is Salcedo Paranormal dot podbean dot com. That's S A L S I D O Paranormal dot podbean dot com. Always happy to hear from you all, whether you have comments or questions or topic suggestions, or if you have stories of paranormal experiences, whether they're your own or from others that you trust. Happy to share those on the show. Um, either by having you send them to me in a text format that I can read or have you join me on the show as well. So I believe it takes care of all that. Tomorrow night, um, the plan is as of now to have Derek on. We'll cover another um, comic book event from Marvel this time. And uh, that is... Um, involves the paranormal, of course, and uh, Thursday will be more um, paranormal news. So um, I have four stories to read tonight for the show, and uh, I got them all this evening. So I will get to that, and uh, thank you all, as always, for listening, whether you are able to make it to the live streams or not, or if you just listen through um, YouTube or the podcast feeds. I always appreciate that. Numbers are still rising, which is amazing, so thank you all so much. Um, so I guess I'll get to this first story here. Um, this one says, When I was 19, I spent the night at my boyfriend, uh, J, they use the initial J, uh, boyfriend's house. His parents were on vacation so we decided to sleep in their room. They have a queen-size bed, which was far better than his tiny twin bed. Uh, that seems weird, but okay. Maybe it's just me. But um, it says, We watched some TV, and then I got up to switch off the TV. As I rolled over, I caught him staring at me with the weirdest look. I asked him what was wrong, and he said it was nothing, and we went, we went to bed. I woke up around 3 a.m. to a little ghost girl standing next to the bed. She had short black hair and was gray, kind of like a black and white movie. I freaked out and started screaming and shaking Jay to wake him up as she disappeared. When I turned back around, the little girl had reappeared, now with a flower. I still continued to scream and she disappeared again. Jay finally woke up and asked what I saw, and I told him I didn't want to talk about it, fearing she might come back if I talk about her. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. The next morning, Jay asked me again what I saw, and I told him I wanted to wait until we left the house to talk about it. He looked me dead in the face and said, did you see a little girl with short black hair? I froze and asked him, how did you know? I had never told him what I saw. He said that when he turned off the TV the night before, he saw a little girl in the reflection of the TV. He didn't want to say anything since he knew how terrified uh, of ghosts I was, but I started, when I started screaming, he knew what I saw. We told his parents what happened the next day and asked if they ever saw anything, and they hadn't. I know the ghost was friendly, but still terrifying. And um, that's the end of that story. I feel bad that it was so so terrifying to the writer. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's sad in a way. I wonder what the story is behind that apparition. Um, it does seem like they didn't mean any harm, 
which is good. And um, it just there is it's I can un- I can somewhat understand in a way how terrifying it can be. The first time I saw it, I think was really um, I was afraid. Um, so although now at, at, at the stage where I'm at, I'm there is part of me that just is confused by that. I just have to remember that first time, and uh, and so I understand. But um, hopefully, there won't be any more experiences. Or if they are, if there are for that writer, then then they'll <clears throat> they'll start to get used to it. Maybe hopefully, and it won't be quite as terrifying as frightening. Um, because uh, as I've said before, overall, most of the experiences I've had even though they did startle me, they were never really negative. There's only a, a couple out of, oh my gosh, I don't even know how many, dozens, um, over, the, over the, the years. It's not like I have things happening every day, but still, I've had several now, and uh, most of the time it's not bad. Um, so I just hope that that writer... Uh, things improve and for that writer and they're able to uh, maybe hopefully someday not be as as afraid and that's sort of what doing the show is for is to show people that these things happen and um, it's understandable to be frightened but um, you don't necessarily have to be Um, it's not all evil by any means so um, felt that was an important one to share there because of that so um, but still amazing sighting. A little girl doesn't even sound like it was a residual. It sounds like she was able to appear and disappear at will. Um, and then reappear. I wonder about the flower. Was that also in sort of black and white tone or colors or not? And then, of course, that is really amazing. I wonder how, where that flower came from. If it was just an image, just like. Maybe the apparition of the little girl herself, just projecting that image of herself to this writer, or was it more than that? Um, It's hard to say. But um, neat story, and like I said, I felt like it was important to share that one. So, let's see here. Um, Yeah, maybe flowers growing on, yeah, growing on her grave, yeah. If it was someone that passed, yeah, could be. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, so that's it for that story. Um, I'm going on to the next one here. The first three are fairly short, and then the last one is longer that I have. Now, these next two have something in common, in a way, and uh, I guess you'll see what I mean when I get there. This one says, so around the time I was seven or eight years old, my family and I would take long drives to other family members' houses. My mom has always been an animal lover and has wanted to work on a farm for as long as I can remember. So anytime we would see a horse close to a fence, we would stop and say hi, pet it, and feed it a carrot or an apple. This one time, though, to this day, I just can't shake off or comprehend in any way. My mom saw the horse and asked to stop, so we did. We got out and did the normal pet and feed, and everything was normal up to that point. My dad said it was time to go, so we all turned around and started to walk away. Then he said to say goodbye to the horse. We turned around to do so, and it was nowhere to be found. This is a big open fenced off field with nothing nearby. It could hide behind, uh, in or behind, excuse me. Literally just an open field. We called out to the horse, nothing. We went back to the fence to make sure it wasn't behind the blackberry bushes and nope, nothing. At this point we noticed there wasn't even any uh, hoof prints where it had been standing, literally 10 seconds before. The field was just empty, 
The funny thing is, nobody in my family except me really remembers that moment. They say they do remember that, that day, but never stopping to see a horse. No, this was not a dream, because I was the type of kid that couldn't fall asleep in a car, the car, no matter how hard I tried. And this was in the middle of the day. I just don't know what to make of this, and was wondering if anyone had any opinions to what it might be. So, that is an amazing story. Um, this horse that apparently they fed, and then it just disappeared. That's the thing to me. If they would have just seen it or and not touched it, um, then maybe you can possibly write that off a little bit easier. But it sounds like they, they touched it, they pet it, and then they fed it as well. And then it was just gone. Doesn't sound like there was enough time for it to run off. And it seems like there would have been sound if it had run off. Maybe not. I'm not an expert on horses. But, um, really amazing sighting. I wonder, too, though, um, of course, it's hard to say, and this is usually more associated with, um, with, uh, aliens or UFOs, but some kind of missing time thing. But then, if it was that much, then I feel like they would have noticed, and that would have been part of the story, too. Um, of course, if it was missing time, then that could have explained the lack of footprints possibly maybe but um again that doesn't seem to be the case there so but um again amazing experience and um positive one and uh neat story so now i will move on to the next one here and uh let me see here so, let me see, let me find it, okay. Let me just grab a quick drink of water. All right. So, this one, let me see here. This one says, this one has always been a fun one to tell. My husband does not believe in the paranormal and thinks it's a bunch of nonsense. At this point, we were still early on in our relationship and living together for a couple of years. He bought an old 1929 house in a suburb near the big city we grew up close to. I would often see the shadows move out of the corner of my eyes and began having a sense that our energy was not the only one there. Nothing too concerning. We had a 120-pound American black lab. Wow, that's a good-sized dog. So it could easily be her moving through the house. Or we can explain it away that maybe the neighbors uh, backed in and the lights just hit the windows just right. One day, I told my guy that I saw a small black shadow walk into the laundry room. <clears throat> I was not taken seriously. Has to be some reasonable explanation. I mentioned it because it wasn't an out of the corner of my eye experience this time. <clears throat> the laundry room is in the finished basement. The only windows are glass block windows with a vent, and they are etched and foggy. They are 4 by 3 blocks, I think, whatever the standard basement window size is. This part of the basement, the windows face, um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, okay, not written the best there, confuse me. In this part of the basement, the windows face into our backyard. There are no lights coming in from traffic. The houses were built in an old apple orchard, so the backyards were long, about half of an acre. 
about one acre between our house and the house ours backed up to. We had an eight foot wooded fence, a wooden fence along the property line. No outside light source. A few weeks later, we were getting ready to go to the store together. I was finishing some laundry and he was in the basement finishing up something on the computer that was down there to the left of the laundry room door. He asked me to put the dog in her crate while he finished up. He would just be a minute longer. The crate is in the basement, but behind to the right of where my husband was sitting. The laundry room door was open. All the lights were off except for the hall light on top of the stairs and the PC. I was standing at the end of the stairs facing my husband and he was looking at the computer. A black shadow dog walked into the laundry room. My husband said, I thought you put the dog into a crate. Nah, I thought you were going to. He called the dog. I was looking at her dog in the crate. Now he is losing his patience since there are things in the laundry room he doesn't want her to eat or get into. Can you please get the dog? He said. What dog? Fine, I'll do it. I'm sorry, they don't have any attribution here. What dog? I asked. Fine, I'll do it, he said. At that point, I asked him to turn around and look in the crate. He looked at the crate, looked back at the computer. He said, uh, it says, you saw it, didn't you? You saw the black shadow go into the laundry room, too. Only time he ever admitted that he saw any, anything in the house. Now, I don't know much about shadow beings. Never really looked into it. We were in this house for eight years and had our first kid here. Never anything malicious or scary. That's where that story ends. Sorry about the uh, fumbling there a little bit. But, um, sounds like, yeah, maybe there was a, a black, or a shadow, a shadow figure of a dog, um, just moving through the house. And, um, here you have two similar, in a way, stories about, uh, animals that, um, are not quite regular, ordinary, in a way. So. Thought that was pretty neat to find those two stories in the same day, um, and I do believe that 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 they have, you know, animals have different kinds of energy and consciousness and souls and all of that, and um, so I don't know why there couldn't be these experiences that people have, um, just depending on the circumstances and and all that. So, thought that was really a really neat story and. Again, another one where nothing bad happened, just uh, surprising in a way. I'd, and again, as I always say with these stories about people that don't believe in any, any of this, I love it when they um, have experiences that they can't just write off like that. So, anyway, um, that's the end of that one. And I'll get to this last one here. This is the long one, so... And this is definitely the last one, because <laughs> it's so long. Uh, this says, about 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in a town in Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poly Palace, I think it's, that's how you say it, P-O-L-I, or Poly, I'm not sure. It says, although it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building except the curtain loft which would have required 
climbing an iron ladder about 80 feet. Nope, it says. And I, I have to agree with him there. You know, with whoever this person is. Does not sound fun. Anyway. It says, the building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in, area in front of the building on the second floor. They had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was uh, from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif. Appealing mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office with high ceilings and crown moldings and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery when two men had, had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of these men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30 gallon bags of popcorn. Wow, that's a big bag. There was a sort of a crawl space under the box office that was accessible by li lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of these rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off of the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was reported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences. I'll start with these, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back downstairs. Oh, I'm sorry, down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, again, he was working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic sounds. He was annoyed that the usher had failed to turn off the machines before punching out and realized that he'd have to go turn them off himself. As soon as he opened the door, the noise stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take these stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of these based on the sources. Here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. 
There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she in turn happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. That woman claimed to be psychic or something. I'm sorry, uh, I skipped ahead a little bit. Uh, psychic or clairvoyant, clairvoyant. Wow, I can't talk. Or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater and that she felt that someone indeed had been killed there and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, huh, okay, sure. She sounds nutty, it says, of course. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night, midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The 7 o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung, up, I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line, where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone. Uh, PBX? Uh, in our building rather than the line itself, or the caller's phone. It was just the impression that I had. I'm wondering if that's like just the system they had there. I don't know for sure what that means. Uh, it says, hello, I said. Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello, I repeated. Hello, a man's voice. Calm, flat, and distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike, it said. It said in the article here, or in the story here. This is Mike. Calm. Quiet. Not shouting over the noise of the line. Quite audible and clear. Then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to, con caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason. Nothing. Mike who, I said, feeling a little impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed th there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead. Silent. The squealing, squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. No one called back. I called the box office cashier and asked her if they asked for me personally, or just to speak to the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. Suddenly I remembered my mother's friend. A man's name, beginning with the letter M. Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises. No one ever confessed to a prank. I never figured out who it was. So that's the end of that story. Um, it's quite a bit of activity there. Um, and uh, really, really weird that um, there was that phone situation. So, um, really odd as well, just the whole series of, um, events there. It sounds like there's been multiple people having multiple experiences there. Um, and, uh, it really is amazing that, um, so many have had experiences. And I, I like how the, the writer researched the history of the place. So... Um, just a neat story that included all that history, and I just thought that'd be fun to fun to share that one. Yeah, the phone story phone stories are weird, um, because 
I, I, I know that sometimes there are ways to prank things, but sometimes it just doesn't seem like that's the case just based on the other things happening or feelings or whatever. Um, so yeah, really neat story there. I don't know. Um, I would love to, to know what else happened in that place after, you know, or with other people as well. So it seems like so many theaters um, seem to be haunted, at least to some degree. And um, so, yeah, a neat story there. And, and it was fun finding all these stories tonight earlier. And um, that's it for tonight. So, again, tomorrow night, the plan is to have Derek on the show. And uh, we'll be covering a, an event called Curse of the Mutants, which is a X Men. It's actually an X Men and Blade crossover. And of course, Blade is a, um, a half vampire who hunts vampires. So it's sort of a superhero paranormal vampire crossover kind of event thing. It's not one that I've read, but I've I've looked into it and it really does seem amazing. So that should be fun um talking about that with Derek. So until then, um I'll talk to you all uh tomorrow. Have a great night and I'll talk to you again on the next episode of Salcedo Paranormal. Take care everyone.